Thank you. Sounds, sounds great. Thanks a lot. Uh, so like who said, uh, my name is Ron Getz. I'm an engineer with analog devices. Um, for those, how many people actually are familiar with analog devices? Almost an hundred? Okay, it's not about everybody. Sounds great. So what I thought that I could do is go over just like uh, two or three slides about who is analog devices, because there's lots of people here with a software background who have never heard of like the big chip companies besides maybe Intel and TI and some of those guys. Um, what I was going to do is talk a little bit about some of the neat features inside the, the 9361, which is actually a chip inside a lot of the Edis products, it's a chip inside a lot of the uh, Epic products and, and uh, a lot of other people's products. And then kind of go over a little bit about um, state-of-the-art, some improvements. Um, the, on Monday, somebody asked us, is SDR keeping up with the worst law? And as a semiconductor guy, I would say no. And so I just want to kind of like describe that in a little bit of detail. As well as maybe give a, a peek into the future in terms of what are some of the things that both um, Amazon Devices is working on as well as uh, some other companies like Silence are working on that will be coming out next year that will uh, ramp things up pretty uh, substantially. So um, Analog Devices is, uh, was founded in 1965. Uh, this year is actually our 50th anniversary, which is actually kind of a big deal for a semiconductor company to be around that long uh, without getting bought or going out of business. Uh, you know, we have about uh, $3 billion for the sales, so we're kind of like uh, a medium-sized company. We're not like uh, platforms like Intel, but uh, we're not like uh, really tiny. We have about uh, 9,600 employees worldwide. Um, the biggest portion of those are located in, uh, in Mass, uh, in the outside of Boston area, and uh, Ireland, uh, Philippines, uh, China. So we're uh, very, very worldwide. Um, and we have uh, 60,000 customers worldwide. Uh, you know, all sizes, all experience levels. And, uh, you know, uh, like a lot of companies, um, 50% is the 80-20 rule. 50% uh, of our revenue is generated from 100 customers. But that what means is 50% of our um, revenue is generated from 59,900 customers. So when you talk about like weird things like, like the long tail and those kinds of things, that is the analog electronics world because it is lots and lots of different applications, lots of different uh, people using them. So uh, earlier, uh, I guess in the last November, Analog Devices uh, finalized the acquisition of Hittite. So uh, for those people familiar with Hittite, Hittite was uh, involved in the very high frequency piece pieces. So now um, we have a product portfolio that basically goes from DC to 110 gigahertz. And we offer solutions in all those different spaces and, and we'll talk about those a little bit uh, later as well. So one of the interesting things about Hittite is uh, they actually did do a lot of connectorized modules. So if you need a, uh, what was I saw on their website last night, a 50 gigahertz D flip-flop, <laughs> we actually made that as a connectorized module, uh, as well as like the signal generators. So uh, the signal generators got interesting. What ended up happening was some of the Hittite engineers decided that, that uh, their eval boards and things that they, they were using as a signal generator were interesting enough to start being sold. So they started wrapping plastic around and having a little software and, uh, so if you're interested in uh, something like that, that'd be kind of interesting too. Um, <coughs> I get a lot of questions when I've been at the booth. Well, you know, why is analog devices here? Um, so this is actually a market research study that was done by UBM. So uh, UBM is a big industry um, uh, forum that like, uh, sells e times and uh, a bunch of magazines. They go out once a year and survey all their customers, or all their, their people. So this was like two and a half thousand people. And they, one of the questions they ask is like, what's important when you buy a chip? Which is very important to ADI. And uh, most of what the customer says is that it's actually the ecosystem is more important than the features of the chip itself. So that's why we are here trying to work with the ecosystem. And that's why I'm sure that other semiconductor companies are going to show up as well. I think the line here was a couple years ago and, and others kind of popped back and forth too. But this is kind of like the, um, the reason that uh, you know people are interested in these kinds of things is when our large and small customers come to us, what they say is, I want before I can evaluate your chip, I want to evaluate it in the GUI that I'm familiar with, in the environment that I'm familiar with. So we need to make it work with the new radio before some customers will even look at the functionality. It doesn't matter if the chip is great or not. But that's the environment they want to do things in. So um, this is a brief introduction in terms of the 9361. Um, 
This is the, the platform that we used to go around with the people. At, and this was actually at the uh, trade show, uh, like 2010. Where this was our software design radio platform. That was awesome. And it was like a conglomeration of like uh, eight different eval boards, you know, six power supplies, four different USB applications that weren't compatible with each other. So you actually had to drive them from four different PCs. It was uh, kind of a big nightmare. And you know, we put this together at this trade show and we couldn't take it anywhere. Um, so time progresses on and that large two foot by two foot or meter by meter kind of board is now in this single chip. And that is the 9361. Uh, we have a bunch of different platforms for the 9361, uh, as well as other kind of like platform or um, SDR boards from uh, FM comms 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We have a very innovative naming scheme. Um, and it's, just, it's basically the difference is 1 by 1, 2 by 2, 4 by 4, discrete. Uh, most of the boards that the ADI offers have an FMC connector, and they would plug into a Xilinx board. Um, Aero Electronics, or distributor and analog devices, they take the board and switch it over to an HMSC connector so they can actually plug it to an Altera board, and that's a, um, Altera Cyclone 5 SOC in the picture. Where these being used is not just general purpose SDR, it's all across the board. It's instrumentation, it's test equipment, it's communications, it's uh, femtocell, picocell, as well as the general software-defined radio platforms. And this is kind of what it looks like under the hood. It's a full two receive, two transmit, uh, RF PLLs, uh, fractional PLLs, clock generation ADC DAC, uh, digital filters, uh, LVDS interface or CMOS interface. It has an enable state machine in it, so that if you're running it in a TV mode, it will actually ping pong back and forth between like transmit and receive. In, uh, and be able to control external switches and external filters and uh, fight the DAX when you're in receive mode and, and turn off the receiver when you're in transmit mode. It has uh, automatic uh, gain control built into the device that can be, has uh, about uh, 30 different knobs to tune. It has uh, you know, auxiliary ABCs and DAX for measuring like RF power and all these other things as well as uh, analog and digital correction and calibration. So this is actually built on a standard CMOS process which means it's uh, without all this digital calibration, the performance would be pretty lousy. And when we talk about calibration, this, these are the kinds of calibrations that actually happen. It's everything from DCO to charge pump calibration to uh, DC offset to quadrature cal, the TX cal, and all these have to be managed by software in the microcontroller on a host. So there's over a thousand different registers inside the device that actually have to get programmed properly and in the right order. And so it's, uh, it's actually quite a burden for people to actually design the chip in. Um, we used to say, OK, here's a register map. See you later. So what we've done is we've actually developed like, a Linux driver for it and an API for it that can be run in like, many different environments. And uh, most people are using that now. But it is um, fairly complex. So one of the other things that, uh, that we have is we tell people how to do factory calibration. So these are calibrations that would basically happen at the end of a production line, from the DCXO to the TX monitor to the RSSI, so they can actually have calibrated pieces as you go up the door. Um, so one of the pieces that uh, we get asked quite often about is the DCXO. So if you think of the, um, like, like we kind of saw in the block diagram, the uh, there's basically one crystal that drives everything. So any errors in that crystal affect both um, your LO tuning as well as your sample rate. So if you're 10 ppm off, that's you know 4 megahertz LO, and about uh, you know uh, if you're running at 61.44, it's basically a mega sample off in your uh, your sample rate as well, which is typically more than like a fine grain and uh, uh, coarse grain kind of like frequency compensation will actually handle. So what we do is on the um, structure inside the crystal, we actually have basically have a variable capacitor, and you can tune that capacitor, and it will actually change the um, the the actual resonance of the crystal by sub ppm, so you can tune right in. So in most communication systems, 
the, uh, the base station actually tells the clients, hey, you're off by you know, five megahertz, and the client will actually uh, retune things. And this can help account for Doppler or temperature stability or accuracy or all these kinds of things. So it's actually kind of an equal cool thing. Um, fast lock, uh, the device does actually have a fast lock in it. So typical calibration, like I was talking, the, the big model list, uh, many of those things have to happen every time you actually change the PLL. And that takes some uh, time, more time than uh, a lot of people, a lot of applications would like. So we do have the capabilities to actually save off these profiles and uh, store them either on the chip or in your baseband processor. So one of the things that we did when um, somebody else was asking, like, okay, well, read the documentation, still don't get it. So he's like, okay, no problem. We'll actually build up in our um, environment a uh, six gigahertz spectrum analyzer. So we'll, uh, we'll take a chunk of data, um, load up, change the profile. While we're changing the profile, we'll load a different profile in with the baseband processor. So it's all this multi-threading. We capture 512 samples, we'll do an FFT on it, we stitch it together, and we get about um, seven frames a second update uh, from just basically walking across the entire spectrum, which is uh, it was pretty good. Uh, one of the other issues is the filter stages. So the, the 9361 has this entire chain to it. And it includes TIA analog filters for image regression or out of band um, signals. The ABC, which has a sine X over X kind of characteristic. It has digital half bands for decimation. And then 128 tap FIR. So uh, the first pieces of the chain, they all affect the pass band. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have where you have things uh, set, they affect the pass band. And so what we can do is uh, we actually have some, uh, an algorithm that was uh, generated in um, MATLAB because nobody else has asked us for a C implementation yet. But it'll actually characterize and look at, like, this is the third order Butterworth, this is the sync filter in the ADC, this is the digital half bands, and it'll actually look at the curve and uh, develop the inverse FF or uh, inverse function of that. So, in order to get a flat pass band, we actually need to um, increase things here to make up for the droop in the analog filters over here. Oh, I can use my mouse? No. All right. Uh, you can kind of see the, the FIR. If we look at only the FIR, it kind of bumps up above zero and then comes down and then kind of goes up. And the reason that works when we program that into the fur is because when we add that to the uh, cascade, we basically cascade that with all the analog pieces and the digital half bands, um, we're compensating for the droop in the analog piece. And this is very, very important if you want to get 64 palm working. And I think that um, a lot of the platforms that um, are shipping now actually support these kinds of things. It's just that few people use it. So if you're not getting the kind of performance you're looking for, this actually may be one of the reasons why. Uh, the AGC, um, the AGC is actually built off a large table that's inside the park. They'll go up and down, depending upon the settings. There are settings in the LNA, in the TIA, in the mixer, and in the uh, digital gain block. It can actually be set. Um, who can tell me why the digital gain block is like uh, a dumb place to have a gain setting? It's already too late. Absolutely, it's already too late. Um, all you're doing, gaining up the noise and the signal doesn't really help you very much. But uh, there are some people who want to provide um, a constant envelope into their baseband processor, and they don't actually care if the SNR changes a little bit. Depends upon what the algorithm in your baseband is looking for. So, you know, this has uh, multiple detectors in here from detectors in the analog domain, detectors in the digital domain. And again, all of these are set by these large tables and uh, some, some of the pieces happen very quickly, some of them happen slow, some of them happen, um, you know, or, or samples that are dependent on the sample rates. It, it kind of just uh, depends what's going on. So there's definitely things you can change if it's not giving you what you want for your application. Um, kind of like peeking through the window to the future, you know, uh, kind of the standard disclaimer. Anytime anybody says anything about the future, that's uh, projection. If I was 100% right, then I wouldn't be here today. You're sitting on an island somewhere. Um, people, you know, if we're talking earlier on Monday about Moore's Law, 
and they say, okay, Moore's Law, here it is, but you know, Moore's Law has kind of been going on for a long time. If you listen to, like, uh, read Ray Kurzweil, um, you know, he really takes it back to, like, 1900 in terms of, like, uh, this progression from, like, the IBM tabulator, you know, all the way up to, like, the mouse brain and the human brain, and thinks, you know, we're uh, on track to being artificially replaced by uh, 2025. So we'll have to see if that actually works. But, you know, Moore's Law in a different light, it's, it's more than just extra transistors. It's the algorithmic pieces and the systems understanding of what's going on. So this is, you know, um, 18 years or uh, two to the nine kind of times transistors. And the realism that's shown by this isn't just by adding 512 times transistors. It's the, uh, the system pieces and the understanding and the algorithms and everything else that goes through that. So, kind of this is kind of uh, this is um, Xilinx's piece. They um, have recently announced their uh, next generation zinc. So just kind of get an idea what that's like. Their next generation zinc actually has um, four ARM cores in it, 64-bit ARM cores. It has an additional two 32-bit hard real-time processing cores. It has a GPU. It has the FPGA. So if you, if, you, if you thought that you know it was a problem in the past, like scaling between FPGA and ARM, now you've got like four or five different things to actually figure out where to run your algorithm in. And you know, which one is the most power efficient, which one is the most area efficient, which one you can actually get done to release your product to production is uh, a lot of different questions. So the, uh, the need for the ecosystem and the prototyping tools to help people make these design decisions is very, very important. So, you know, it's, uh, it is going to be a big challenge for everybody is scale across 64-bit ARM, FPGA, real-time cores, putting that inside a, um, a VM, which this chip will support as well, it uh, kind of um, blows your mind. I mean, it's not going to be, uh, you know, five bucks, but uh, it's, uh, it's going to be pretty impressive when it uh, comes out in uh, 2016. Uh, this was a, a chart I grabbed actually from uh, Georgia Tech, where they said it's like, oh, Moore's Law is one thing, but you know, it's the system integration that's actually happening is actually even more impressive. And we've actually seen this step this week with, um, you know, the Pico Z song, uh, the Epic Sidekick, and the the, uh, the E310 are having incredible amount of components and an incredible amount of transistors all packed into these small form factors. So everything is getting much, much smaller. And it's, uh, you know, one of these big trends is happening. When we talk about converter performance, which was what kind of like uh, people were asking me a couple times, there's so many different converters, it's hard to say like, oh, you know, which actual, what direction things are going. And when we look at like the different applications from uh, digital oscilloscopes to weigh scales, they have very different needs. And then there's kind of this bound of uh, bits of resolution versus speed. And that kind of like uh, curve pushes out all the time. And uh, on the SDR piece, we are getting much, much faster sample rates, both from an architectural and from a silicon perspective. And I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, this is kind of the usual debate of, uh, you know, the Plato versus Steve Jobs throwdown. You know, is it uh, the market pulling things? Is it uh, people requesting things? Or is it technology developing itself and uh, providing that to the market so before the market actually knew it really needed it? And you can say the, the same thing that uh, ultra scale is like, well, how many people like four years ago thought they would need four 64-bit ARM cores in a uh, embedded device that they could, uh, they could ship? It's, it's kind of crazy. 